friends. Congratulations on making it through another week, even if only barely. Are you in your Lululemon yoga pants yet? Your baggy Morona PJ bottoms? Are you even wearing pants at all? Cheeky perverts. That's how you give your family pink eye. Well, it's okay, because you don't need pants to experience the warm tickle of a story in your ears. But you just might want to grab a blanket and cozy up, because we've got two new dark and shivery tales for you today on Listen With The Lights Off, a radio horror show. Brought to you by So Say We All and La Jolla Playhouse. I'm your host, Jennifer D. Corley. Our first story is performed for you by the talented duo of Alyssa Ann Austin and Solomon Maya. Hope you're hungry for some soup and your gag reflex is lazy. Slow Waves by Sarah Jean Alexander. I added a cup of chopped carrots and onions to the pot and stirred the soup. Jack walked over and took the wooden stirrer from my hand. He lifted a spoonful to his mouth, blew on it for a few seconds, and tasted it. Okay, add the beans. I picked at a bit of dead skin that was peeling off underneath my thumbnail. Are you sure it has to have beans? Yes, that's the only ingredient that's actually necessary. I stirred the soup again. I know, but these beans were really expensive. We'll make it back. We'll make even more. We'll make a thousand times what you paid for those beans. He touched the braid in my hair and followed it down the center of my back. He gently pressed his fingertips into my skin, where the braid ended and my lower back began, then walked out of the room. I thought, I believe what he says about the beans, and continued to stir, adding pepper and salt and bay leaves and rosemary and thyme. Jack came back into the kitchen a little while later with my jacket, scarf, and knit hat. I dressed while he poured the small pot of bean soup into a black thermos. He took a hand-painted ceramic bowl from the cupboard and placed it on the counter next to me. I picked it up, and we walked out of the front door, bowl and thermos in tow. The night was empty and quiet. We walked against the wind, our faces down to keep bits of twigs and leaves from blowing into our eyes. After a while, we reached the sand dunes and climbed over them towards the pier, about a half mile in the distance. The wind had blown plastic bags and soda cans into the sea, and now they dotted the shoreline and bobbed against each wave. I felt angry about trash being so near to the ocean and tried expressing this to Jack. You have to be quiet or none of this will work. I wanted everything to work, so I stopped talking. The moon glittered off the aluminum cans and I watched the trash out of the sides of my eyes and kept walking towards the pier. Jack came to a stop a few feet before the pier and took the ceramic bowl from me. He pushed it into the sand so that the top was almost level with the rest of the beach. He untwisted the thermos and looked at me. Are you scared? I shook my head. Good. Jack poured the bean soup into the bowl and recapped the thermos. He reached for my hand, and we jogged to the end of the pier. Jack carefully leaned over the edge, and watched small waves lap against the wooden posts. They were decorated with seaweed. The water was black. I tucked my knees under my chin, hugged my legs, and watched Jack watch the water. He looked back at me. Are you scared? I shook my head a second time. 
He smiled and squatted in front of me. He put his hands on my shoulder. It's okay if you are, but you shouldn't be. I'm not scared. Jack kissed my forehead, and I felt his hands tighten on my shoulders. There. There's one. A head surfaced above the small black waves near the end of the pier. Its dark hair flowed delicately, back and forth and back and forth, as the head moved closer to the shore. A thin neck appeared, almost translucent in the moonlight. I had never seen a mermaid before. It was not beautiful. It was about half my size, with glowing skin and a black tail. When it reached the sand, it struggled to move outside of the water, its eyes on the bowl of bean soup. Jack began inching back towards the bowl as well, making sure to remain unseen by the mermaid. I turned to face the bowl, still hugging my knees, watching everything quietly converge. The mermaid rested on its elbows, lowered its head over the side of the bowl, and lapped at the bean soup like a tired puppy. Its hair was twice the length of its body and drying quickly now that it was on land. Everything but its skin was a dark shade of green and gray. The mermaid seemed to be in competition with the night sky and the moon. Watching it made me feel heavy. I wanted to feel my hands on the sand, inching closer to the bowl. I wanted the mermaid to watch me watching it. Jack stood a few feet behind the mermaid as it ate. The only things I could hear were the slow waves and the mouth movements of bean soup and tongue and teeth. Then came Jack's quick breath. His foot pushed into the sand and I saw his arm go up and I saw the long knife in his hand and I closed my eyes. I opened them and looked at my knees, my shoes, the wooden planks under my feet and the cracks between them. I could only hear slow waves. I looked up and saw Jack walking quickly towards me down the length of the pier, holding the knife in one hand and a long, dark thing in the other. It was all of the mermaid's hair. Jack was smiling, but also looked nervous. Are you scared? No, I'm not scared. Jack put the knife in his belt and helped me to my feet. The mermaid's hair moved towards me with a force I didn't understand. As we walked down the pier, Jack talked excitedly about how much money we were going to make. There's just so much of it. Do you want to feel it? It's soft. It's so long. I made such a straight cut on top here. Look, almost none of it is damaged. I looked back at the mermaid as we climbed over the sand dunes. It looked so bright without its hair. The mermaid and the moon reflected the light from one another. Two lonely bodies, too far apart, only visible when everything else had become quiet and dark. I guess beans really are a magical fruit. That was Slow Waves by Sarah Jean Alexander. When the coronavirus started, everyone was making jokes about how many babies were going to be born nine months later. But we adults know the real spike will be in divorce or murder, whichever is cheaper. So let's turn away from relationship dynamics and enjoy a little retreat. 
like being regaled by far more privileged friends who can afford to use the words summer and winter as verbs when making travel plans, will enjoy a vacation vicariously through Jay, portrayed by Patrick Mayuyu. Don't relax too much. Welcome Back by Jay Wurzler. Dear Helen and Marie, first of all, I know what you're thinking, and don't worry. I'll get to all of that. Just hear me out. It's not as bad as it looks. Second of all, thanks so much for having me here in your home. It was exactly what I needed. It's so nice to get out of the city and into nature. I only encountered the drain spider once when I dropped a hot pocket in the sink. That thing is invincible. Both spider and hot pockets. Also, regarding the broken knife, I grabbed it from the kitchen because it seemed kind of old, and it just snapped off in my hands while I was whittling out in the deck, uh, trying to earn that scout badge I never got. You were right about the neighborhood. I never ran into a soul. I mean, I heard some cars come and go down the dirt road, and there were lights in a few of the other houses that are tucked away on the hills, but otherwise, it was just me and Patty on our own, relaxing and living the Waldo life. My first day, I took her for a walk and explored that trail you listed on the instruction sheet, the one that cuts through that guy's property and leads to the abandoned log cabin. (laughs) Super creepy. When I said above that it was just me and Patty, I was kind of stretching the truth. Don't worry. Nothing crazy happened. I just invited a friend from the city to hang out one night. I know I didn't mention this possibility before because it was kind of a last-minute thing. Anyway... He came over one night for a few beers, and we just sat around, smelling the nature. Okay, that's a stretch, too. There were four of us. Me, Danny, Chris, and Ella. I don't really know Ella, but I think she and Chris are dating. Maybe exclusively, maybe not. I don't really keep up with that stuff. Anyway, Ella had these mushrooms. And I mentioned I was house-sitting for you in the woods. And one thing led to another, and... Yeah... I want to be perfectly honest with you, since we worked together for so long, and I felt like you were really my mentor before you quit, and sort of responsible for the professional person I've become today. So where was I? Oh right, the mushrooms. Don't worry, I know I'm saying that a lot, but really, don't. We went up into the open space reserve and found a nice little patch of woods to explore. Nobody saw us, or if they did, we didn't see them. Okay, so, the weird part. The night after everyone left, last night, Patty and I were just chilling on the couch, reading a tarot book I found behind the icebox. I dropped a cigarette back there. Unlit! So ended up pushing it away from the wall, hence the couple of scratches on the floor. Anyway, she's lying at the end of the couch, between my legs, when all of a sudden, her ears perk up, and she starts barking at the door. I'm a little bit stoned, in the interest of honesty. And it takes me a sec to realize what's going on. Patty jumps up and starts clawing at the front door. I'm looking out the windows. It's weird you guys don't have any curtains, by the way. Don't you worry about people watching you change or have sex or whatever? And there's nothing out there. I mean, it's pitch black, so I can't really see anything. But I open up the door anyway to check it out. So as soon as I open the door, Patty darts out into the darkness. I know, I know. I can hear her little paws brush against the leaves and her claws scratch against the stone steps that lead up to the road. But then all of a sudden, it's silent. I grab the flashlight from the mantle and her leash from the wall and head up towards the road, calling her name. I get about halfway there when I hear some leaves crunch behind me. Not like right behind me, but kind of off in the distance. I turn around and call Patty again, but she's not there. Side note, I took your advice about listening to podcasts before going to sleep. It really helps my brain relax and also is educational. I listened to some of those businessy ones you sent me, but truth be told, I'm sensing a theme here, lol. I've been hooked on those paranormal podcasts where they talk about ghosts and swamp monsters and whatnot. People call in with these stories and the host believes every single word they're saying. It's fantastic and is especially interesting when it comes to dreams you have later. I was listening to one a couple weeks ago that was all about shadow people, which I'm not sure I totally understood at first, but this one lady described them as being this void of space in the shape of a human. 
sort of like a walking black hole. That wasn't exactly how I'd describe what I saw. I don't know if you wear contacts, but there's this thing that sometimes happens where the gunk in your eye will stick to the front of your contact. It doesn't hurt or anything, but it makes this little spot in your vision where everything is kind of blurry. But the brain doesn't interpret it as blurry. It's more just like something is off. Imagine that feeling, but a little off in the distance, back by the front door where I heard the leaves crunch. So anyway, I rub my eyes and whatever was or wasn't there isn't there anymore. And when I turn back around, there's Patty, just sitting by my feet, smiling and panting. Patty, I say, what in the world has gotten into you? I pick her up under my arm and clip the leash onto her collar. She licks my face, and as soon as I set her back on the ground, she runs off in the other direction, yanking the leash out of my hand. At this point, I'm not sure if she's running because I'm chasing her, or if she's chasing something else. I put the flashlight up next to my face like a cop, calling out for her to stop or freeze or whatever. We end up about a quarter mile down the dirt road, where the little pond is. Don't even think about it! I shout, but she's already squeezing under the chain link fence that surrounds the whole thing. I catch up to her and lunge for her back legs, but one of my arms catches on a blackberry vine and digs an inch-long gash into my wrist. So I'm bleeding everywhere, including onto Patty's back legs, just as she slips onto the other side. She's barking up a storm, running in circles around this pond, and I'm just trying to get her to come back over here so I can maybe grab a hold of the leash that's trailing behind her and go get this cut cleaned up. But she's clearly after something and won't listen to me, and I swear... There's this little dust trail that she's chasing that I can't make out. She does two more laps, and then there's a click of nails on the little pier that juts out into the water on the other side. What is up with that pier, by the way? I mean, the pond is disgusting, totally algaed over, and smells horrible when the sun is out. Anyway, this little click of nails on wood is followed by Patty's nails that scrape along the surface to a halt, and it looks like she's cornered whatever is out there. Suddenly, she lunges and the click, click, click scurries back to the mainland. But Patty's put all her weight into it, and being so tiny, she can't stop herself when she started. She does this little twist and tries to right herself, but it's too late, and she does a pathetic little slide into the pond. There's a gurgle and a splash, and then the whole thing goes still. The stupid little whatever scatters into the woods and it's quiet again. I run around to the other side near the pier where some of the barbed wire is flattened out and pull myself to the top of the fence. As soon as I get my jeans caught on a spur, I see where the fence has been rolled to the side, probably by those kids you warned me about who wait till their parents go to bed and then smoke on the wooden balcony in the middle of the freaking forest. I smelled the smoke, but never saw them. I decide it's better to just keep going, though, and I drop down onto the other side, tearing my jeans in the process. It was not graceful, let me tell you. So I'm trying to remember on the instructions what you said about how she has two vets, one for one thing and one for another, but I don't even remember what day it is. Remember, I'm high. Also, your lighter's out of fuel. And none of it will matter if I don't find her soon. But I'm also thinking to myself, there is no way in hell I'm getting into that nasty excuse for nature when all of a sudden, I see her leash and collar pop up in the middle of the pond. I shine my light across the scum and watch it kind of float there, making ripples along the surface. I call out for Patty. Look, I know this is a difficult thing to hear slash read, especially after the Zen retreat you guys were on. I was reading the brochure you left in the bathroom. It looks amazing. I'll check it out sometime. But bear with me. I'm trying to make sense of it all, too. Back to the pond. The collar is floating on the surface, leash in tow, and I call out for Patty. Like that. And this is where it gets weird. Er, The collar starts to float towards me. The leash trails behind it, sort of like a limp water snake. It's not just floating anymore. It's moving. On its own. It gets closer, and I back myself up against the fence as it gets to the edge of the water. Then out of nowhere, it rises out of the pond and jumps at me. I swear, I'm not making this up. I'm down on the ground, 
hands in front of my face, this color coming at me like it's going to kill me, and then I smell it. The unmistakable wet dog smell. There's a pressure on my legs, something dripping on my pants, and the sensation of a dog tongue in my ear. The collar is licking me to death. I grab the leash and pull the collar off of me. Okay, pull the dog off of me. I mean, she is there, but she isn't. But she is. There is a weight on the leash, clearly. I pick her up in my arms and lift her up and down a few times just to make sure it's not the weed playing tricks on me. <laughs> it's not. We slip through the fence and I wrap the leash around my arm just above my wrist, trying to make some kind of tourniquet and put pressure to stop the bleeding, but it just makes me bleed more. So we run back to the cabin. Thankfully, nobody saw me acting like a crazy person, bleeding all over the road and running with a leash and collar with no dog at the end. So I go to push open the door with my good arm since my other arm is now pretty numb and starting to get cold. But of course, it locked behind me when I ran off after Patty. I'm literally mid-swing with the axe when I remembered the spare key by the porch light. But it's too late. I tried to clean up most of the glass inside, but it was tough because I couldn't find a broom and the pieces were too small to pick up with my fingers, so I tried to kick them to the side of the room with my shoe. Anyway, I reach in and unlock the door, and Patty tugs on the leash as soon as we get inside. I scream because it tightens around my wrist and I am leaking everywhere, hence the rug stains. I flail around trying to unravel the leash, but some of the blood is drying and sticking to the hairs on my arm, so I just unclip it from the collar and Patty runs to her water bowl in the kitchen. I grab the last of the toilet paper and wrap it around my arm, but it just gets real bloody real fast. So I grab the first thing I can, which happens to be the terry cloth bathrobe that's hanging on the door of the bathroom, which is a bummer because, man, that thing is soft. I find some scissors and cut the arm off and wrap it around my cut. A little duct tape from the desk drawer keeps the whole thing from sliding around. I think I would have been an okay caveman. Not great, but able to at least keep the family going another generation, you know? Anyway, I'm already feeling kind of woozy from the run and the blood and the whole episode of it all, but I need something to calm myself down. So I turn off the lights, spark up the rest of my joint, and fall back on the bed. I'm out within minutes, clothes on, over the covers, trying not to think about how I'm going to tell you that your dog turned see-through. Next thing I know... I wake up sometime around 3 or 4 a.m. to a little whimper in the living room. I try to get out of bed, but my arm drags me back down. It's twice as heavy with all the dried blood. I crane my neck so I can see into the other room and call for Patty. The moon is shining through the windows, and I catch a little glint of something shiny moving through the darkness. I know I should get up and check. That again, this is my one responsibility. But look, I gotta be honest with you. I'm scared. This is already way beyond what I'd anticipated this week, and it's not about to get any less complicated no matter what I do. But then, there's the matter of the eyes. They're out there. I can feel them. I don't know where they are or what they're doing, but seriously, all I can think about is how you need some curtains. So I pull all the sheets off the bed. I was going to throw them in the washer before you got home anyway, and put them in a pile in the middle of the floor. Patty's collar and leash are hovering in the corner where the whimpers are coming from. I throw a sheet over her, just so I don't trip on her, and try and pump myself up for what I know I have to do. I remember the day you left work, after that guy came in pretending to have a gun under his jacket. We'd already been talking about how you didn't like the city anymore, how you just wanted to settle down somewhere quiet and do things for yourself, live off the land or whatever. That's all fine and good, but why did that plan have to include a basement crawlspace slash spider den where you keep the important things like tools and canned food and spare toilet paper? Once again, I take the flashlight from the mantle and throw open the door in the floor. I'm sure it's a very convenient storage space when it's not the middle of the night. I count to five, hold my breath, and rush down the creaky stairs, trying to steady myself with my good hand, but they're too steep and I slip and ride it down like a water slide. I land face first in a fresh spider web, which immediately makes me feel like there are things crawling all over me. My arms start to itch and there's a tingling sensation in my neck and I'm just hoping that at least I get superpowers out of this thing because you know, our health insurance isn't that great. I get out of that horrible hole as fast as I can and get to work. I'm halfway done nailing sheets to the windows when the whimpering comes back. 
By this time, I've turned on the light, and I look in the corner where Patty was, but the collar and leash are gone. The sound is coming from somewhere near the couch, but it's muffled and a bit more forceful. I get down on my hands and knees and shine the light under the couch. I wish more than anything that I hadn't done that. It took a second for me to even figure out what I was looking at. These big black dots and little white dots, throbbing and pulsing, climbing over each other in one uniform shape that went from Patty's left foot all the way up to her hind leg. Flies and fly babies, hundreds of them, going to town. She must have gotten cut on the fence when we left the pond. I gag and I hit my head on the edge of the couch as I pull away. It is absolutely disgusting. But I know I just can't leave her like that. You've got to come out of there, Patty, I say. Come on. But she doesn't answer me. She whimpers again. Again, I count to five, hold my breath, and look back under. I use my good arm to support my weight and reach my bandaged arm under the couch and try to pull her out. As soon as I get close, the flies disperse. The whimper turns into a growl and pain shoots through my arm. I yank my hand back from under the couch, but she comes along with it. To anyone else, I just look like a guy whose skin is suddenly springing bite-sized leaks. But I feel the full weight of her jaw on me, and I swing my arm around, trying to get her off. Look, I swear to you, all of this was just gut reaction, and I was just trying to keep things together as much as possible. I mean, I know I said I was a dog person, and in the interest of transparency, (laughs) no pun intended, seriously, I'm actually more of a cat person, which I think I actually mentioned to you once. But maybe I just dreamed it. I just want you to know that it's not like I meant to knock her into the fireplace. Let's just be thankful there wasn't a fire going or things could have gotten real bad. So anyway, she slams into the rocks there and lets out a little yelp and finally lets go of me. I'm just trying to get to my feet and get away, but this maggot leg charges me, and out of instinct I put up my legs and kick. She goes flying and smacks into the door in the floor, and I look up just in time to see the leash tumbling into the darkness below. I roll onto my stomach and slam the door shut, then roll on top of it and lay there, catching my breath. The only thing I can think is... WTF! I don't know how to explain it. I know it sounds crazy, and I swear I'm writing this stone cold sober. It's seven in the morning, for goodness sake. She stopped barking about an hour ago when I threw a bit of food down there. I haven't figured out how to get her water yet, but I think she'll be okay until you get back tonight. I wanted to tell you this in person. I truly did. But I can't stay here anymore. I had this whole excuse I was going to give you about how I had put in for today off, but... Ted called and said I was only approved up until yesterday, and the new guy called in sick, and so Ted's just working the register and kind of freaking out because tomorrow is National Free Slurpee Day, and he's still waiting on one of the machines to get fixed, but the truth is better. I think you told me that once. It may be harder to swallow, but it's better in the long run. Okay, running out of paper here, so gonna wrap it up. I think that's about it. Thanks again for having me, and I hope you guys had a great vacation getaway. Welcome back. Namaste, Jay. P.S. I forgot to water the plants. I know, I know, I'm a dummy. But given the situation, it seems like not the biggest deal. So, yeah. Honesty. Reliable house sitters are so hard to come by. If you want to avoid disappointment, do what I do. Get your help from the Casual Encounters section on Craigslist. The most it'll cost is a trip to the free clinic and a new can of Lysol for the dungeon. In any case, that story was Welcome Back by Jay Wurzler, and that is the end of the stories for today's episode, my dears. Please, please do join us again next time for more surprises, dark turns, and fuel for nightmares. Like your Tinder matches, but more interesting. This episode of Listen With The Lights Off is created by So Say We All in partnership with La Jolla Playhouse as part of their 2020 Digital Without Walls series. All the stories on this show come from So Say We All Press's horror anthologies, Black Candies, created by the horrifically talented Ryan Bradford. Please do buy the books, available through our website, 
so say we all online.com. Listen with the Lights Off is produced by myself, Jennifer D. Corley. Editing is myself and Justin Hudnell, So Say We All's executive director. At La Jolla Playhouse, Jacole Kitchen is artistic programs manager and local casting director. Mary Cook is communications director. Amy Ashton is producing associate. Becky Beagleson is director of public relations. Mia Fiorella is director of sales and marketing. And Nancy Showers is senior multimedia director. Our intro theme is by Kurt Conan from AMFM Music. Our outro theme is by Daniel Schreer. And all of the scoring and sound effects you hear during the stories performed come from our Foley artist maestro, Scott Paulson. If you'd like to learn more about La Jolla Playhouse, visit lahoyaplayhouse.org. And to keep in the loop with So Say We All, read more about the artists who made this project possible and become involved as one of our future storytellers, visit sosayweallonline.com or just find us on social media. We're still trying to figure out the new Facebook. Until next time, I'm Jennifer D. Corley, And remember, if you find yourself feeling terrified and alone, there's probably good reason. Now, more than ever. (laughs) 